Hopefully, as a nerd, I can get my laptop to work. Yay. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very honored to be opening this event. Um, <clears throat> as, as has already been explained, my name is Adam Laurie, also known as uh, Major Malfunction or RF Idiot. Um, I'll explain a bit more about that. So, I'm a white hat hacker. I've been a hacker for getting on 20 years now. Um, started a long time ago, obviously, 20 years, before this was properly an industry. Um, and in fact, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit into some technical stuff because I was advised this is a reasonably technical audience and you won't want to just listen to me rambling on about my life as a hacker. Um, so normally I'm here presenting, if, I, uh, if I'm presenting at a conference, I would be presenting my latest research. Um, but because I was asked to give the opening keynote, I thought, well, what I should do is actually look back, you know, every now and then we should take a step back and look at what we've done over the years and what the industry looks like now compared to what it looked like then. And there's a lot of people here, obviously, who haven't been in the industry that long or as long as I have. Um, there will be a few who have. Hands up anyone who's been in this industry for more than 20 years. Oh, quite a few then. Okay. 10 years? Five years? Okay, so it's a reasonable mix. Um, so, I mean, yeah, some of you will understand what I'm saying when I start talking about the way the industry used to treat us versus the way we're treated now. Um, and for some of you, it will be completely weird and, and new. Um, so, anyway, uh, <coughs> as a white hat hacker, uh, I've always um, promoted what we do, and I've always practiced what we do, and it's never, it hasn't always been completely understood. So in the early days of DEF CON, for example, you know, I'm a DEF CON goon, uh, we're in year 26 now, I started at number 25. For the first 10 years of DEF CON, nobody there knew my real name. I was only known as Major Malfunction. And that's not because, you know, I was the baddie or the criminal, and I was hiding behind, um, you know, we all have silly names, we call them handles, but um, basically we all have, you know, funny names. And I was there as major malfunction because if my clients in the UK knew that I was traveling to Las Vegas and going to a hacker conference, I probably would have lost a lot of those clients. They wouldn't have trusted me to deal with their systems. I was dealing with a lot of the very early telco and banking um, internet systems, you know, right at the beginning of the internet. Um, and they just didn't understand uh, that there was such a thing as a white hat and a black hat. There was no such definition then. Um, so yeah, for, for 10 years I went to uh, DEF CON as major malfunction. Uh, I'm very much into open source, so one of the early projects I was involved in is Apache SSL, which came, went on to be the de facto uh, secure web server platform. Um, and pretty much everything I do, if you go and look at any of my research, where I can, I will publish it. So I have various repos on GitHub. I've got um, rfidiot.org. Um, in fact, this, although it looks like a messed up QR code with my picture in it, um, that does actually work as a QR code if you scan it, if you're brave enough to scan it, anyone. Um, that will take you to my home page, and that will then take you on to a bunch of, of open source tools. So um, where I can, I publish my code. And I, I contribute to tools. And I would encourage anyone else who gets involved um, in this industry um, to not you know, try and hold stuff back. If you use open source tools then, and you do something to improve it, or you find some neat little trick, um, then contribute it back. Uh, because, you know, we all depend on that. We depend on that infrastructure. And, and um, again, you know, having been in the industry for so long, I've, I've seen what happens when you don't contribute back. And there's some, been some very big um, cases where 
with Apache SSL specifically, um, in the early days of the internet, people tried to commercialize it. And so it was a, it was a free open source product. Uh, at one point, we had 70% of all the world's secure web servers using our software. But because it was free, obviously, we didn't make any money from that, apart from a bit of consultancy around it. But companies came along, and they tried to commercialize that software. Um, one big example being IBM. Um, and IBM released their own version of Apache SSL. Uh, and for several years, they tried to maintain it as a separate commercial product. Um, but what happened in the end was um, they just couldn't keep up. The, the, the commercial team couldn't keep up with the, the pace of development of the open source team, so they were constantly playing catch up. And so it, they actually shot themselves in the foot. You know, they would end up with a commercial version of some open source software that was three revisions behind. So in the end, they did the sensible thing and they just joined the Apache team. So they just put their whole team into the open source Apache team instead, and then everyone was happy. Um, and I see that a lot still. Um, currently, I'm doing a lot of work on, I, I work for uh, Aperture Labs. I'm one of the directors. We do a huge amount at the moment on smart meters and, and um, critical infrastructure, uh, security systems and in base embedded systems, alarm systems, stuff like that. And a lot of the tools that I'm working on um, are open source, or that I'm using are open source. So things like Wireshark, um, and Zigbee in particular I'm working on at the moment. And I was surprised how many um, kind of side projects there are that are claiming to use these tools for doing Zigbee IoT um, assessments, but the actual main core uh, repos are so broken that you couldn't be doing any meaningful testing with them. So they must be taking those away, fixing them, and then not contributing back. And that's disappointing. So, I mean, I've started pushing some stuff back in to, to resolve that. But um, again, if you're working in that field and you're using open source tools, then please, you know, don't hang on to your little jewels that you found. Push them back in so we can all use them. That's my lecture over. So. Um, so this is the kind of stuff I've been working on, um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, magstripes, satellites, uh, chip and pin. Uh, and again, as I said, I thought, well, I'll have a look back at some of the early stuff and, and talk about a particular hack and then compare that to something new. So here is a little video clip of um, a show I did. It was a, a documentary in the UK, and it was a guy who was looking at privacy in general and how technology uh, is supposed to be making us more secure and, and enhance our privacy and security. What he didn't know is that at the same time he was doing the program, I had been secretly contracted by the producer to spy on him using the same technologies that he was talking about. So this is a, a kind of five minute clip that introduces all the technologies we're going to talk about, I, I will <clears throat> then just single out one of them, because otherwise we'll be here all day. Um, oh, sorry, I've skipped a bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the things, I mean, I've kind of touched on this. Um, we have actually got to the point now where we understand white hats and black hats, not all the hackers are the bad guy. Um, amazingly, in the early days, again, the early days of DEF CON, and DEF CON was very instrumental in changing this, um, big companies didn't have, you know, there wasn't security at Microsoft.com in those days, or security at wherever. Um, if you tried to, if you found a problem in someone's product, they would probably assume you were the bad guy. And they didn't really want to talk to you. It was quite hard work to get them to listen, to say, well, no, I'm not trying to blackmail you. I'm not trying to get some advantage out of this. I found a problem in your product. I need you to fix it because I want my clients to use it, and I want them to be secure. And DEF CON made a big difference in changing the mentality of, that, um, of those companies. And in fact, I remember the year when Microsoft came along and said, Okay, you know, every year you guys hack us, and every year 
we come out with a new version of everything and you break it anyway. So this year, we're going to tell you our plans in advance. This is what we're planning for the new release of, of Windows, and these are the security enhancements we've done. What do you guys think? You know, and they actually gave us advance notice. And from that point on, <coughs> excuse me, um, everyone kind of jumped on the bandwagon, and all the companies then got it. You know, suddenly it's like, oh, actually, this is a huge resource out here of people trying to help us to make our products better. But amazingly, before that happened, you know, now it's just normal. But back then, it really wasn't. We were having to convince them we weren't trying to hurt them. We were trying to help them. OK, so here's the little movie clip. We are constantly told that modern surveillance technologies are for our own safety, that CCTV protects us from crime, and that new RFID passports will help fight terrorism. Many of you may still think they're a good thing, but have politicians overestimated the security of the technologies themselves? It's something we were about to put to the test. While I have been filming this program, I know I have been watched. <laughs> Two hours outside London, is an old nuclear bunker now used as a highly secure facility where companies protect and store private data. It is here that I was about to find out just how secure the technologies that track us really are. The first thing I saw as I entered the bunker was a monitor playing CCTV footage of me walking down a street in London. And deeper inside the complex, loudspeakers started playing a recording of my voice. But the man who started the company based here has promised to explain everything. Adam Laurie is a security consultant who exposes weaknesses in high-tech systems. And while I have been investigating technology, it seems technology has been investigating me. Yeah, so you probably recognise the voices, that's you having a meeting with Heather Brook. He had somehow managed to make Heather's mobile bug one of our meetings. And so we were bugged. So basically, yeah, the phone not only bugged you, it was also a tracking device to find out where you were in the first place. Without me knowing, Adam had signed Heather up with a perfectly legal company which offers to pinpoint the location of any phone registered with it. He then used a Bluetooth communication facility on her phone to listen to our meeting. So I was able to bring up a map showing where that phone was, drive to the, the general area, scan the area for the Bluetooth. Once I found it, I then, you know, I had a visual on you guys, so I, I saw you sitting there. I was in a cafe around the corner, yes. initiated the connection, told the phone to ring me, and then recorded the, the conversation. Nice. These, um... And how did you acquire these? Adam had also accessed CCTV cameras that were filming me on the streets of Soho. They transmit on a wavelength that is surprisingly easy to intercept and so allow the images to be captured. You were going to be going to this meeting in Soho, so I, I scouted the area beforehand with a simple handheld scanner and was able to record images from cameras pointing out on the street and capture you on your way to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's relatively harmless. They're just street cameras, but the same technology is used inside buildings for security. And actually, they're making the place less secure because yes. they're broadcasting it to the world. So. Yeah. I normally work at home and now have a wireless internet system, but apparently, this can make my personal emails and internet searches available to whoever wants to see them. OK, so what's this here you've got here? OK, well, you should be able to recognise that. That's an email from you. Uh, yeah. Basically, I came to your house, sat outside, scanned the street for Wi-Fi networks, found your network, and then intercepted you sending that mail. 
Right. So anyone could do that. Anyone could have done it, absolutely. So you've got, you can use my phone to record conversations and track me. Yep. Use other people's cameras to take pictures of me. Yep. Snitch my email by sitting outside in the van with a bit of equipment. Yep. What else can you do? One other thing I heard that you've actually had a, a chip implanted in your arm. I have. So if I could read it. Do you know where it is? Yes, I know, it's, it's, it's here. Okay. So that should be your ID number. Yes, it, yes I remember the last four digits. <laughs> so that can be read with an off-the-shelf commercial scanner. Now I've done that and I know your number. Um, I have some blank chips which I bought over the internet. So those, is that what your chip looks like? That's exactly what it looks right. like. Right, so there's no reason I can't now program that number into that chip. Right. So have that implanted in my arm and then I'm you. Then you're me. Yeah. Even the chip in my arm, promoted as a secure means of determining identity, could be cloned. But Adam's most staggering revelation concerned a piece of technology that almost each and every one of us will soon be carrying. I know you've been looking at the new passports and ID cards and yes. so on, and that's a concern for me yeah. as well. I mean, here's a new passport, and this has a chip in it. That's the chip, is it? That's the actual chip that um, will have your data stored on it. Yeah. And my concern is, you know, the privacy of that data. So I was curious what was actually stored on there. So um, I've written some software that will actually try and read it. Can you do that? So yeah, what I'm going to do now is, is read this one. This is my son's passport. And after just a few seconds, all the personal details stored on the passport came up on the screen. Adam had cracked the new RFID passport, introduced for its supposed security. And this, remember, is the technology that will be used in the ID card. OK, so this is the, um, the data that's stored in the passport. So we've got his name, full name, date of birth, yes. nationality, and so on. So can so can anyone pick up this passport and read it from a scanner, or do they need something else? It's slightly more complex than that. You actually need a key. Yeah. You need a cryptographic key to be able to read it, but the key is derived from information that's fairly easy to get hold of. Yeah. So it's basically passport number, date of birth, and expiring date of the passport. And they're all jumbled up together, are they? They're, they're jumbled up in a particular way, yeah. which is a published algorithm. So you know, I downloaded from the internet exactly how I jumble them up. Um, so. You know, once you have that information, you can log into the passport and you can read it. It's unbelievable. We asked the Home Office to respond to our findings. They said, the chip is one part of the security features used in the e-passport, but being able to copy this does not mean that the passport can be forged or imitated for illegal or unauthorized use. But the fact that we have been able to read secure data from the passport without opening it is still of enormous concern. So it's interesting that the government response to that is uh, it's like a change of stance. Initially, the, the passport was introduced, and this is going to be, um, you know, it can't be broken, it can't be copied, it can't be cloned, it can't be tampered with. Um, but when you actually demonstrate there is a problem, then it's like, oh, well, it's only part of the solution. Yeah, so it's, it's no longer... How many people here actually think that the digital passport is secure? Anyone? One, one person. <clears throat> and he's winding me up. Um, so yes, there are safeguards, it's all digitally signed, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not sure how much real testing has been done. I think you've probably done more here in the Netherlands than we have in the UK. Um, they refused my kind offer to go and have a play with their readers at the, the airport. Um, I know some stuff was done here because I did, I helped one of your researchers um, who worked on this stuff. And actually at one stage, um, the, the passport reading um, software is so robust that we were able to uh, present an emulator to a passport reader here in the Netherlands and over the GSM network it connected to a reader at my house in England where I presented my son's passport and the reader in the Netherlands thought it was reading his passport locally in the Netherlands. So 
Um, not only can you clone them, but you can deliver them remotely over the GSM network. So that's quite cool. Um, you can also um, change them. There is a database that um, it, it contains signatures which should detect if someone tampers with it, but there's been many cases where people have gone through um, with passports that haven't read properly or haven't worked properly or they've accidentally taken the wrong one. Um, there's a case in the UK where a, a bloke and his girlfriend went through and they had their, each other's passports and they still got through. So something's not quite right in there. But anyway, the, the detail I was going to go through, um, the attack uh, that I want to talk about, the technical uh, detail, um, came from a very simple problem. So uh, in that clip, you know, I, I followed the guy to a meeting and I bugged him. Um, and the way I did that was by abusing a Bluetooth floor, uh, which was basically um, an open RFCOM channel. So RFCOM is literally just a serial port over Bluetooth. And it's used in a lot of the other protocols. So things like file exchange or um, exchanging your uh, phone details, you know, if you want to send a phone book entry to someone, they will use a higher level protocol, but underneath it uses RFCOM for the actual data exchange. And um, bizarrely, Nokia and Sony Ericsson had both made the exact same error in their Bluetooth stacks, and they had left um, an RFCOM channel open, which gave you access um, to all your SMSs, the phone book, the calendar, and any AT command. So it's like being connected to a modem. You could tell the phone to do anything you can tell it to do with an AT command. So because I could get to the SMS um, facility, he mentions in the clip that I had signed him up to a tracking service. So it sounds like I had their cooperation. Um, I didn't. I used um, the phone book, or I used the phone to call me to get the number. So I, I, I connected to the system. I did an AT dial. It called me back. I then had the phone number. Um, I could then go to the website of the tracking service, type that phone number in, and what they would do is send a text message to the phone to say, you, you're signing up to this service, do you want to accept that? And you would send back yes or no. Because I was connected, I would see that message coming in, I replied yes, and then I deleted the message. And as long as the phone wasn't in someone's hand at the time, and that, or it was, you know, it was just lying on the table, they would be none the wiser. There would be no trace left in the phone that that conversation had ever taken place. So I now had a tracking facility, uh, I also had the calendar, so I looked in the calendar, saw when the meeting was coming up, I knew where they were going to be, um, and as you saw, basically, I, I didn't know exactly, um, so I drove around and, and used the Bluetooth scanner to, to find her phone. Um, because I had full access to the phone book, I could get details of any other third parties that might be useful, maybe I want to track someone else. If I see someone else at the meeting, I'm now you know, in, in a position to, I've got their phone number already, I can do the same trick with them. And then the AT command allowed me to initiate a callback. So while they're sitting there talking, I, I told the phone to call me, and then I'm just using their, their microphone as a bug. Great. So the industry response to this you know, was, before all that was done publicly, we had, you know, probably 18 months earlier, we had found the same problems and we had responsibly disclosed to, uh, even though that term didn't exist at the time, um, to Nokia and Sony Ericsson, we went to them and said, look, we found these problems. Um, and they didn't believe us initially. And in fact, they went to a lot of trouble to, um, to try and prove us wrong. We had meetings um, with some telcos who basically uh, tried to stitch us up during the meeting. We had one guy who said, okay, prove it, um, and then turned his Bluetooth off under the table while I was doing my demo. Um, and sadly for him, what he didn't realize was that that particular phone was using a software-defined radio, so it was only logically turned off. So when I actually sent the... Uh, I think I used a, a bug that would crash the phone. When I sent the bug that rebooted his phone, it, the look on his face was just priceless because he thought he had killed me. Um, 
But uh, yeah, so it took a long time to persuade them that this was a real problem, and then it took them, even after they accepted it was a real problem, it took them another 18 months to release a firmware fix. Um, but one good thing that did come out of that was we were then invited, um, there were three of us involved in this uh, process. Uh, there was me, was a guy called Martin Herfurt from um, Salzburg, and um, Marcel Holtman, who writes the Bluetooth uh, stack for Linux. And the three of us together were invited to uh, join the Bluetooth SIG and go to these um, things called Unplug Fest. And an Unplug Fest is basically um, a kind of geek um, get together. And it was neutral ground for all the geeks from all the different companies that were producing Bluetooth products. And they would meet three times a year in a hotel. They would take over pretty much the whole um, meeting space. And they would lay out tables so that, uh, like Sony Ericsson would be on one side of the table, and then Nokia could be invited to come and sit on the other side, and they could do interoperability testing. And one of my favorite things about the whole process was on their website, when you went to sign up, it actually said on there, um, are you a manager or a salesperson or a marketing person? In that case, you're not welcome. Are you a techie? Can you actually fix things? Yeah, then sign up here. But theoretically, you weren't allowed to come to the meeting unless you were an actual engineer, software engineer, or some kind of techie. And it was great because we ran the security desk there and all the companies would come to us. Here's our new firmware, here's our new model. Can you hack it? Do these, you know, uh, uh, do these hacks work still on these products? And the, the events generally lasted about five to seven days. And usually, you know, if you found a problem, by the end of the event, they would have come back and it would be fixed already. So before we left the, the, the event, stuff was getting done. And it was great. And I've never seen that process being done in any other environment. I mean, I, I don't know. Does anyone know? Does that go on in, in any other um, industry? You know, we're all interconnecting. All our products supposed, supposedly talk to each other. But that's the only thing like it that I know of, where everyone got together under one roof, all the competitors, and they just thrashed things out and made it work. Does that exist anywhere else? No. OK. So you know, thumbs up to them. Um, Apparently, after doing this for a little while, all the problems were solved, so they didn't need us anymore. So Bluetooth is now 100% secure. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so yeah, we, we stopped doing that a few years ago, but um, it was good for a while. But now we live in a very different environment where, you know, Security is cool and everyone's spending lots of money and there's lots of events and, and razzmatazz and I go to Vegas every year to DEF CON still and the spin-off Black Hat um, is huge. And you see stuff like this. Um, this was a marketing slogan from a company who I've chopped off the bottom and I can't remember what they're called and I really don't want to remember because in what world is that a good idea? I don't get it. Why, why do you want the bad guy to innovate and become better? I, ju I just don't understand that. But marketing, big business gets involved. Um. <clears throat> and now we have some pretty huge stuff going on. So um, who's heard of the Cyber Grand Challenge? A couple of you. OK. Who's heard of the film Terminator? OK, this is the point, OK? 2016, you'll be going back in history. That's when it all started, OK? Cyberdyne Corporation and machines became self-aware. So this is insane. These machines behind me were built atop decades of program analysis science, engineered over two one-year stages of competition, and built by pioneers. Program analysis scientists, hackers, and engineers. So tonight, these machines will play capture the flag against each other. Tomorrow, we hope the lessons learned will change the field of computer security. Thank you. There's an enormous amount of computational power ready to be unleashed here at CGC. Beneath the stage are huge amounts of electricity and water needed to power and cool the supercomputers on the stage. 
300 kilowatts of power. That's enough to power one and a half city blocks. 180 tons of water flow through these pipes at a rate of 200 gallons per minute to keep the computers on the racks liquid cooled at all times. The entire stage is air gapped to protect the data and the systems. The air gap also validates that there's no other outside influence and no human interaction. Everything that happens inside the air gap is autonomous. Data flows through the air gap through an air gap robot that literally reads Blu-rays of burn data from inside the game. The air gap robot physically moves the Blu-ray across and outside the air gap, then drops it into a reader that goes into our scorers and visualization. At the center back of the stage is a system of computers that's a digital referee. It issues the challenge sets, communicates to the bots, and handles the scoring and systems. The only humans in the game are inside the air gap. These are our human refs. Ready? Ready. Game started at 0945 seconds Pacific. Welcome everyone to the first ever fully automated cybersecurity automated competition. So what we'll see here today is much more than the world's first all-machine hacking tournament. The lessons learned could lead to a world where computer viruses, malware, and attacks are discovered in a matter of weeks, days, or even seconds. Right now, all the teams are playing. They're all interacting with the system. All of them are finding vulnerabilities. They're all fixing them. Uh, every single team is playing the game, and they're all advancing the state of the art. This concept that we've talked about, we've so when he says team, he means machine. So this is completely autonomous. There's no guys, it's not like capture the flag here where there's guys sitting out and working the problem. Um, this was round two. In round one, the, I think, seven competitors were chosen, the winners from the previous year, were each given three quarters of a million dollars to go away and build their system to come and compete in this year's system. Um, and what you had was a completely autonomous, automated capture the flag where machines were analyzing systems they'd never seen before, protocols they'd never seen before, looking for vulnerabilities, designing attacks against them, attacking them, and at the same time defending against other people attacking them. Um, so yeah, pretty scary stuff. Uh, so as I say, you know, if you've seen Terminator, this is the point where the machines all start to fight it out amongst themselves. They probably elected a leader who is currently plotting our downfall, but we don't know because they won't tell us. Um, so anyway, back to my little part of the problem, which was uh, Bluetooth. Um, <clears throat> there's a TV show called uh, Person of Interest. Anyone seen that? Okay, so there's this great technique they use in there called forced pairing. First you break into their home and go through all this stuff. Email, financial records, personal effects. Then you hack into their cell phone. As long as it's charged and has signal, you can use the GPS to track them. You can use the microphone to listen into their conversations, whether they're talking on the phone or not. Hi. I'm sorry, I have call back. Third step. You need picture. Okay, so we've got a modern TV show where they're using that technique that I was playing with back in 2008. Um, how realistic is that now? Well, I can't show you this video clip because it's behind a paywall, but if you want to, you can take that URL and go and watch. I did a piece with 60 Minutes where they challenged me to, to see if we could do the exact same thing with a modern Android phone. Um, and in fact, yes, we could. Um, so basically, I came up with this. I called it Bluetooth, because um, if you feed Android enough NFC, he poops out Bluetooth. So, so basically, NFC has a, a thing underneath it called NDEF. NDEF is an information exchange standard, and it's used for giving you information. So like on a smart poster, you can go and touch the poster, um, and it will give you some data. Or it may configure your Wi-Fi to connect to a particular closed, uh, closed loop access point. And I discovered it had this thing called Bluetooth handover. 
and this was to make Bluetooth pairing easy. You literally just touch your phone against something and it initiates a pairing. Um, so I start Bluetooth handover, that switches on Bluetooth. I target an open service like Obex Push, which is an exchange of um, information like your uh, phone number. If I want to give you my, my business card, I would use Obex Push. Um, so unlike the earlier attack where that channel had been left open for anyone, um, in this case it's there because you choose to use it. And normally a message would pop up saying, do you want to accept this data or do you want to pair with this guy? Um, but all I'm doing is connecting to the channel. I haven't yet sent any information to say, I want to send you a business card. I've just connected to the OBEX channel. Um, and once that's done, we've then got uh, a layer called HCI, which is um, the layer that Bluetooth, the two Bluetooth devices use to communicate with each other and send commands to each other. Now, Bluetooth um, is always encrypted. So they will have established a session key uh, in order for that encryption to work. And one of them will have just decided, I'm the master and I'm the slave. Um, and that's done automatically, no human intervention required. So again, this has all happened in the background. The phone hasn't popped up any messages yet. Um, but either side can request a key exchange. So at any time, you can say, I want a new key, give me a new key. So I just tell my HCI layer, I want to use a new key, here's my new key. <clears throat> the Android phone receives that new key puts it in its local storage, and what should happen next is you go through pairing or you go through a process where the user is asked if they really want to complete this action. Um, but what I then did was crash the Bluetooth stack or kill that process by just cancelling um, the, the initial operation, which is the, the Bluetooth handover. So the Bluetooth stack resets, and as part of its reset, it reads its local keys file. And it's, any keys it finds in there must be trusted or they wouldn't be in the key file. So I skipped a step. Uh, there was no human interaction to say, do you trust this key? The Bluetooth stack found it there at startup. So it must be trusted because it got in there in the first place. So the phone is now pwned. And again, that gave me access to the AT commands and all the the fun that goes with that. So surprisingly, same problem, new day, 12 years later, however much it is, um, 10 years later, apparently the Bluetooth problems aren't all fixed. Who knew? The industry response was when I, uh, sec when I responsibly disclosed it, I was actually encouraged by the people I disclosed it to to enter a bug bounty competition which was coming up. So instead of just giving them the, the, um, the vulnerability, they said, well, bring it to Tokyo, enter the pwn to own contest, and you might win some money, and we still get the, the vulnerability reported. Um, so I did, and they gave me a huge sack of cash, and everyone was happy, it was great. We should do more like that. It's not like the old days where you just did it for free. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, I'm so good at timing. 59 seconds to go. So, do we think all of those things are now secure? Everyone? No. Okay. So, there's one last thing. I will run over by a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Um, I had lunch with uh, Ralph Moonin the other day. And we were talking about the robots taking over the world and that everything was going to be fine and technology's progress is always good. Um, so this one's for you, Ralph. Customer pilots directed almost 3,000 precision strikes last year. We're super proud of it. It allows you to separate the bad guys from the good. It's a big deal. But we have something much bigger. Your kids probably have one of these, right? Not quite. Hell of a pilot? No. 
That skill is all AI. It's flying itself. Its processor can react a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional, disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. Now, trust me, these were all bad guys. Now that is an airstrike of surgical precision. It's one of a range of products. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. A $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city. The bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. Just characterize him, release the swarm, and rest easy. Dumb weapons drop where you point them. Smart weapons consume data. When you can find your enemy using data, even by a hashtag, you can target an evil ideology right where it starts. Scary. Um, I don't know about you, but that's not the future I want to see. Um, I think we're out of time. Do I have time for questions or are we done? <clears throat> Well, if there's one very urgent question, I will throw this to you. If not, we'll continue. Anyone? Three, two, one. Your cool. chance is up. Thank okay. you very much. Thank Adam you. Laurie. Thank you. Thank you.